I was in McDonald's in Carytown, and there was a guy behind me, and he was talking about Bill Hicks, saying that we really, and I don't know what that was in relation possibly they were discussing revising uh, NASA's policy towards space exploration, more emphasis on this, that, or the other, they're discontinuing the uh, space shuttle. And this guy says that Bill Hicks said that we should clean up the Earth first and then go out into space. Well, Bill Hicks also said, don't eat in McDonald's, it's evil. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. you know, it's just like any other religion. It's like, love your neighbor, but I sure hate those gays. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like every other religion. It's oh, more yeah. honored in the breach than it is in the... I mean, that's the cool thing about comedy, though. It's like somebody can make a point. I mean, I, I like somebody like Bill Hicks or George Carlin or Doug Stanhope or one of these, you know, very, like, topical people who talk about, you know, societal issues and all that. But And I agree with probably all three of those guys more than I don't. But any of them say things that I don't like, and it doesn't, like, discredit what they've said before. It's not like, you know, I, I you know, I'm saying, oh, well, you know, he blurted out this line about this thing, and I don't agree with that, so I'm done with it. You know what I mean? No, I'm, I'm talking about the people that... I'm not talking about so Bill Hicks writing, himself. Writing some jokes? Yep. I'm not talking about Bill Hicks himself. I'm talking about uh, uh, his quote-unquote followers. Well, that's what I'm saying. The like, cult of Bill Hicks. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, maybe this guy agreed with Bill to this extent, but maybe he thought Bill was full of shit when it came to McDonald's. You know what I mean? That's, that's all I'm getting at. But mm -hmm. I do see the You're irony. being charitable. I think he didn't. He doesn't know. He has a surface yeah. knowledge of Bill Hicks, and if he really knew Bill Hicks, he'd know that... Yeah, you know, go ahead, you're probably it. you're probably right. I'm probably giving I'm an idiot the benefit of the doubt. Being a cynic, <laughs> it's easy. It's 2010. It's easy to be a cynic. Yep. Uh, which is that could be a whole <laughs> podcast under itself. Oh yeah, we still got we still have a lot to talk about for this week, don't we? Okay, so we'll move, move right along. <laughs> move right along. So we had uh, City Dogs on on Sunday at 9.55 Comedy Club, and that was your first time doing that. Do you have any mm -hmm. thoughts on that? It, it was a great was room. It, what do you, would you call it a showcase? That's what I would call yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, I did a, a, like a five-minute showcase spot. Uh, it was it was great room. We didn't get the normal room upstairs because um, they double-booked the room, so we had to be down in the bottom part, and it actually worked really well. It was packed, and... Um, we had a great crowd and uh, good good responses. There were there were a lot of funny uh, comics. Kenny Kenny Wingle was the headliner. Uh, Jeff Kern was on that show. Uh, yeah, th it was it was a good time I think overall. And I, I had a blast. It was my first time booked on the nine fifty five show, and it was I had a blast. So thanks again for inviting me. And so on Tuesday we had the Buck and Comedy Throwdown. And I characterize that as being all-star lineup. Had uh, of course Kenny it's Kenny Wingle's uh, event presented by, and it was Blake Midget, Bill Metzger, you, uh, James Polk, James Polk, David Marie Garland. David Marie Garland. He was the winner. He, DMG won. Uh, yep. Or as I refer to him, OG. DMG, <laughs> original gangster DMG, or OMG, yeah. oh my god, David Marie Garland. Oh my god, it's David Marie Garland. Hi, Jim. Yeah. And I, he that. does get that reaction from some, <coughs> some people, some audiences. And it, that would be an example of, uh, 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 and we were discussing this with a, a comedian recently. We name no names. Uh, and I think you'll know who I'm talking about. And he was sort of distraught because he wasn't kicking ass the way the other comedians were. And my response was borrowed from Judy Carter, which is, fuck them if they can't take a joke. Sure. And some audiences you're not going to click with or whatever. So maybe find the audiences that this particular comedian works with. And I don't think I'm 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 not dissing David Murray Garland, and I don't think, and I think you probably agree with me. He has a certain kind of unique, original style of comedy, and 
it's not going to go over at the Hanover County American Legion's post. No, it's not. Yeah. You know, it's, that's just the nature of the beast. He, if he gets I don't think there's the, anything wrong with that. No, if he gets a hold of the right crowd, he, I mean, he was, he was on fire on Tuesday night at that show. I mean, there was no way anybody else was going to win that contest. Uh, he was, he was just, he had the crowd eaten out of his hand, and he was, you know, he was perfect. Um, and that, that you're, you're right, that would not work everywhere. Um, but he, uh, he was, he was absolutely hilarious on Tuesday night. Um, and we, oh, should we uh, talk about our celebrity? Uh, yeah. yeah. Andy Dick came to uh, came to Gibson's Grove for the Buck and Comedy Throwdown. His son Lucas got a little bit of time on stage. That's his name, right? Lucas. Lucas. Lucas Dick. Yeah. Lucas Dick. Yeah, and uh, Andy Dick was there, and I think uh, David Marie Garland actually probably fell in love with him. And they, they were. They were like they were, they they were, were like in a sandwich at yeah. the bar. <laughs> they were attached at the hip. Don't no no homo. Don't read yeah, anything into yeah, that. Yeah. When yeah. I say sandwich, I mean they were seated at the bar, and they were having <laughs> drinks, and like one was on, on the other side of the other. Yeah. But uh, um, yeah, so he he made a man witch. <laughs> so uh, yeah, Andy Dick made an appearance. You know, that was fun for everyone. Yeah, I'm always uh, torn in those kind of situations. I don't like want to be uh, uh, to borrow a phrase from uh, the Rolling Stones. I want to be a star fucker. Yeah. So I don't like to, you know, it's like, and also like give people their space. Yeah, exactly. And to be honest, I really don't have any to, to, to much to say to Andy Dick except I enjoyed news radio. Right. I enjoyed the Ben Stiller show, and there's, you know, probably other things. I bought your album, mm -hmm. uh, but I mean that's probably something he's heard from a zillion other people. So it's not like I have something original yeah. to contribute to his to his discussion. I got to shake hands with a guy, which I think is kind of cool. Um, so, and I, you know, I got some pictures of him and, and Kenny Wingo. I, I wish I had a better camera because flash, flash, point and shoot flash cameras don't necessarily, at least this one doesn't give people bad cases of the red eye most of the time. Mm -hmm. But I wish I had a camera like uh, Adams that was, you know, could shoot in low light and could get a better uh, better shot. And also the other problem I run into is like my camera is a, it's slow recharging so it's like I'm shoot, wait five seconds to recharge, shoot. And so Henry Cartier-Bresson, the magnum photographer who lived in France, talked about something called a decisive moment. And I'm like getting more like the indecisive moments because of the limitations of yeah. the camera uh, so yeah it's like I once I once uh, I was once was in a uh, in a restaurant in, in Barrack Road in, in Charlottesville and Sissy Spacek was there and it's like the poor woman's eating lunch or dinner or whatever it was and it's like she doesn't need to hear from me so I just tend to my reaction is uh, is to leave people alone and, and uh bask in the reflected, the reflected glory. I agree. So I just, I really didn't try to interact with him or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, Jason, I wish J Jason, uh, unfortunately, uh, Jason Klingman has work obligations and he had, he had some adventures and things he could tell, tell his grandchildren or maybe, uh, what reminded, it reminded me of, uh, there was a movie with Peter O'Toole based on, uh, I think, the Sid Caesar show, where this where this guy is following, sort of playing the role of uh, of uh, shepherding Peter O'Toole, who plays this notorious drunk English actor, mm -hmm. which I don't think was much acting on Peter O'Toole's part, and it was called My Dangerous Year or something like that. So maybe you know one one day there'll be a movie about Jason, thinly disguised movie about Jason Klingman and Andy Dick. Yeah. But at least he has something to tell his grandchildren sure. or, or whatever. Sure. Uh, but and to be honest, and since Andy Dick will never listen to this, um, I don't really see Andy Dick as a stand-up comedian per se. Uh, I'm not saying that he, you know. 
he's not he's not what I would call a, a stand up comedian. He's comedian. He's uh, I, I think of him as a comedic, he's a comedic he, actor. He, yeah, he's a comedic actor. Yeah. So he's not gonna uh, and there's some people that you know, for that reason aren't aren't turned on by him. Yeah. But uh, I think it and I think Without getting into too much detail, there are lessons to be learned from Mr. Dick. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, as to what to do and maybe what not to do. In, yeah. in, in the, well, from from those from those that you know, the stories that are floating around, uh, you know, the the reputation that precedes them is completely accurate. Right? Yeah, we're so, not we're not exactly uh, breaking any new ground yeah, here. It's exactly. like Google Andy Dick or you know read his. Biography on Wikipedia. Yeah. So yeah, you can. You can. You, you can read all the stories if you want to. There you go. And they're true. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't there, so Alleg I can't say. Allegedly, they're yeah. completely true. I can't say. So. Um, oh, should we talk about uh, Aztec? Yeah. Um, yeah. Odyssey Michaels Aztec Grill um, Wednesday night. Um, that was an open mic. That was a lot of fun. Uh, who? Uh, Antoine Scott. Was the, was the he drops teacher. by on a fairly regular basis, and yeah. he's been on like BET and yeah, that was the second stuff time. like that. And he's a, he's a touring comedian. He's a professional comedian. Yeah, he, and he was he was very funny, and we had you know all the all or most of the locals you know showed up. And you didn't you didn't go up that night. Um, I no, I lost. I was doing my, again. I was doing my bit about I have Alzheimer's, and I, for whatever reasons my uh, I don't know my my. I call them scripts. Mm -hmm. I, I had, for lack of a better word, I somehow it fell out of my uh, my uh, backpack or whatever. So uh, some of downtown homeless, uh, Richmond's homeless have yeah. been entertained for the past week. A jealous comedian stole it out of my backpack. <laughs> my brilliance threatens them, and they took it from my backpack. <laughs> so I didn't do it. But again, I, I'm I'm feeling a little more philosophical because there's like. <coughs> There's a lot more open mics, so it's like I'm not not as I don't have as much of a hard on to be on every open mic because I sort of feel like I'm in it for the long haul. So yeah. uh, if I miss one, uh, I'll hit another one. And I, I sort of I've sort of gone when I started out. I was kind of like, eh, I either, I was either dealing with stage fright or I was sort of like, well, I'd rather stay home and watch. American Idol. I've never watched American Idol, but yeah. whatever, Survivor, something like that. Or, you know, I've seen all these guys before and I'm sick of them. So I wouldn't, and now, then I went to the like, I'm hitting the anvil. I'm out there every chance I can, wherever I can. And now I'm sort of maybe in a little more relaxed mode. And it's sort of like, what, what else can I do? I mean, if I don't have the script, I don't have the script. Yeah. So I try to be like, well, you know. Well, so it is. Well, Aztec's a, it's a great room, and I hope we can kind of get that. Uh, I know Odyssey's working really hard, so I, I hope that'll end up being one of the better open mics in, in Richmond. I, great, great food. I think there's a consensus. Um, I think there's a consensus that it's a great room. Yeah. But I, what you tend to see with a lot of these open mics or events is you get people that sort of come out to check it out. And then it kind of drops off a little bit. So I think it's just a matter of time, or at least I hope it's just a matter of time. It just, it just hangs in there. Uh, I think there might be, and again, I'm certainly no expert, I think there might be something to be said for like having a venue every week. And people say, well, if you want to go, some com if you want some comedy, come to, uh, come to the Aztec Grill every Wednesday because if you're doing it like every other week it's like I don't know is there comedy this week maybe maybe not how do you find out whatever yeah. and if you know like week after week after week maybe you, know, you might build an audience there and the other going going back to uh, to uh, Andy Dick at uh, Buck and Comedy Throwdown what I liked about that was, and we've discussed this before, it's sort of like, unfortunately, there's the attitude, and maybe it's deserved 
if you believe silver, it's like New York is better, LA is better. So it's like we're not going to come out because this is like Richmond and we have an inferiority complex. Mm. I'm not but, a native Richmonder and I, I would rather be in Richmond than either one of those towns. Just to, I mean, well, maybe, maybe not for the comedy, but... You that's know, a as, subject for a podcast, too. Yeah, I mean, you know, but, but you yeah, know, that's, 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 that's people letting, you know, their own inferiority get, get the better of them, I think. Well, I, you know, I find it more interesting to watch comedy from people that I know just simply because I know them. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's just me. Yeah. But uh, long story short, the point I'm trying to make is if Andy Dick shows up, it's like, okay, comedy is cool. It's sort of like guilt by association. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, and like there, there are people, and I saw this on Facebook, who are kicking themselves and saying, hey, I wish I'd gone. Because so I would think that hopefully that'll continue. And those people say, well... I'm going to this because maybe something cool, extra cool, will happen. Yeah. Of course, probably nothing extra cool will happen for another five years. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. I was glad I showed up. Yeah. Uh, so we we we'll go back backtrack to. Uh, do you say everything you want to say about? Uh, Aztec, yeah. Aztec, Aztec is every Wednesday, and uh, it alternates between. Um, uh, an open mic and a book show, and this week coming up it'll be a book show. I don't know who is on, but uh, you know Odyssey, I'm sure, will put on a good show. So I hope. Well, that's the advantage. That's the advantage of, of uh, Odyssey's <coughs> extensive background in comedy. Is he has a big yeah. talent pool to draw from. Yeah. Um, I I would I'm personally I think it's more like maybe one to three or two to one or whatever book shows. But no. I could be wrong. What else was going on? Oh, uh, Wabi Sabi in Petersburg on Friday night. You and I both did that show. Did anything happen on Thursday night? Kasi's? We drove down to Kasi's. Okay, well, let's, yeah, let's talk about news. that. Yeah. Yeah, we did. A little bit, anyway. Um, Kasi's is a fun place to go. Now, that's a, that's a uh, thing that, again, relates to, to various issues. Uh, we're talking about... Uh, yeah, that's smart. Um, used to be, my impression is that uh, there would be as many as 30 comedians show up. And this is what we call wild sound in the movie business. <laughs> And we're supposed, we should have a coughing, we should have like a kill switch for coughing too. Yeah, just poke me, cough it as much as before. Actually, this thing does have a pause on it. Yeah. Uh, but it used to be Kazi's was once a month, and as many as 30 comedians would show up, and they would cut it back to three minutes instead of five. But now that they've gone to twice a month, and there is also another night that is competing with, there's another open mic, and I don't know whether they're only like doing it once a month or twice a month, and I don't understand the logic, and I'm sure if I were living in Virginia Beach, I would, why there have to be, has to be two uh, uh, open mics in, in Tidewater on the same night, I don't know. Well, as a, as a com I mean, as a comic, I, I can't, I can't talk about, you know, the business aspect of it between the two different clubs or whatever, but... As a comic, I mean, if I if I know there's going to be 30 comics going to an open mic, and I'm going to get three minutes, or there's going to be 15, and I can do five. I think I did seven or eight the last time, I, this last week at Kazi's, um, because there weren't all that many. Um, I mean, I'm going to go. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd prefer the situation where I can have more time, you know, and and um, and, and and have a choice as to which one I go to, but. Um, I mean, you know, as far as the business aspect of it, that's, you know, maybe something that, you know... Well, it, 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 it also may be political. I mean, yeah. that's... Co co comedians are just like religions. You put you put three comedians in a closet and you come out with four different factions. Yeah. 
So that, you know, I don't know the background behind that. My personal feeling is I don't like, Kazi's been, it, what's that guy you say, baseball been very good to me? Oh, uh, oh, the Garrett Morris character yeah. on SNL? Kazi's been yeah. very good to me, so I'm a Kazi's person. Yeah. I'll buy no. the t-shirt, I'll watch the DVD, I'll see the feature length movie, I'll buy the soundtrack, because that's, yeah. you know. Yo, yeah, no, Kazi's was Like, a, know what side the, uh, your bread is buttered on, blah, blah, blah. Kazi's is the only club I've played in that area, and it's the... Thank it, you, it's, Motorcycle. It's the first one that ever, you know, booked me on a show. So yeah, so I'll, I, like, I, I did a showcase. Totally be, I would totally be uh, uh, loyal so. to him, but, but as far, you know, as far as the... If I were living in Virginia Beach and I was going to all sorts of things, I might have a different attitude. Yeah. Okay. It's like John Orr says, it's like, he, his philosophy <laughs> is... Don't over become overly identified with any one group, but of course, I guess he lives in the Tidewater area, and he's like doing the Funny Bone and Kazi's and whatever. So, uh, so you know, and so I have I have no no problems with anybody. Yeah, no, it's, but it's always fun going going down there. It's a great club. I like it. Yeah. So I think there's been things that maybe gotten a little more diffused, which is not not a problem for me because obviously I'd rather do five minutes than three minutes. Yeah. But uh, when you kind of get that two competing open mics, or you go from once a month to twice a month, and the the, the pool of comics in Tidewater or anywhere else is not infinite. Yeah. So there's going to be a certain amount of diffusion. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of it's kind of like uh, you know market principles you know let's you know if you've got two competing you know um, groups or two competing uh, entities you know um, let's say Kazi's was the only game in town for a long time and so you had anybody who wanted to do you know open mic comedy on a Thursday night that's where they went and now all of a sudden there's somebody that can offer can also offer you know open mic comedy well you know maybe and I'm not saying anything I think Kazi's is great but you know maybe they kind of make each other have to kind of one up each other to you know be the better club to come to you know so my observation that in central Virginia is that comedians tend to be territorial mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't think that would apply in New York City for example because there's like probably at any given point a whole a, a ton of open mics going on at any given time in yeah. Brooklyn Manhattan or whatever but around here, I think people tend to get peeved if you book a show, if you come into somebody's quote-unquote territory, uh, there's a, you know, there's a feeling like yeah. you're poaching. Yeah. And if you're doing a show on the same night as somebody else, it's like, well, couldn't you have done that? You know, on a different Maybe. night. But yeah, but I mean, people, you know, people got to schedule things how they can. And you know, I, like I said, I think. Um, you know, it, it can do nothing but good for the, the scene and the comics and probably the clubs in general to, to have to kind of compete with each other, um, at least initially, you know, and say, um, you know, it kind of, it gives people, it's always good to have options, I think. So. Well, you know, my, for example, I deliberately schedule this on Sunday because I didn't want to compete with the Funny Bone writing session. Yeah. You know, I don't think they're, and I don't think they're competing anyway because the funny bones out in short pump, and some people can get out there, and some people can't, and some people are doing things on Saturday afternoon, and they're not doing them on Sunday, and vice versa. Yeah. So I'm not doing it. I didn't uh, do it as an attempt to compete with the funny bone writing session. Um, yeah. Well, I, I just think you know, if, if you're if you're territorial or you know this, I'm not this, this Oh no, I'm saying in general. You know, just the general. I view. just didn't want. I didn't want to step on any toes at the funny bone. Yeah. Because yeah. I have the greatest respect for them. Blah blah. Well, blah, blah. I mean, you're not you're not generating any business or anything. But, but this thing, like, like, uh, um, you know, but like, you know, if you're if you're a club and you know, and, you, and you're a monopoly, you got the only game in town. You know, I think it's great if somebody can offer an alternative to what you got and. Um, if nothing else is gonna, you know, make you uh, force you to, you know, step up your game or 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 lose your customers or your your acts or whatever, you know. Same thing, you know, if if comedians get territorial, you know, 
I mean, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes, but because I pretty much get along with everybody, but you know, I, I'm not gonna. I'm not going to go out of my way to offend anybody, but if there's things I want to do, I'm not going to say, oh, this guy's established and, you know, so I'm, I'm not going to do something, you know, that's going to, because that's his night, he has this show on this night or whatever. Um, that's, that's just me. That's what I would call a hypothetical, and if I were a Supreme Court Justice nominee, I wouldn't be willing to address that. I don't book shows yeah, I, don't do, I, don't I don't do showcases I don't do an open mic but based on my observation of the Richmond area if I were what I would do is I would go to everyone in Richmond who was doing a show and say hey I'd like I'm gonna do this whenever how do you feel about that do you have any plans to do something that night I would consult because and I'm not saying it's bad or good it's just my observation I think sure. people around here are territorial yeah. yeah now you know it's like there's I used to do zines and and somebody once said uh, that you would think that the US Postal Service they do things the same way everywhere but this zine publisher said it actually helps you work with the post office to realize that every post office is like its own distinct fiefdom. So the comedy rules in New York might be different than the comedy rules in Richmond. Sure. sure. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. So, have we discussed Wabi Sabi yet? No, we started to. Uh, Wabi Sabi was on Friday, Jason Klingman's show. And you and I were both on that show, and they, they were a great crowd. And um, Travis Charles, Jared Cullum, yeah, uh, David C. Wingfield, mm -hmm. um, Corey Jason Marshall, Klingman. Corey Marshall, Corey Marshall, yeah, Corey Marshall was uh, he handled the heckler like an absolute pro. Yeah, you know, he did very very well. very smooth. He very wasn't, smooth. Yeah, he wasn't he wasn't offensive or mean, but he was very funny and witty, and and he jumped right back into his material and he was, he was I thought he did a great set well I, I you know personally I think he can get away with like precious jokes mm -hmm. because he's black well, yeah, African American yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever I don't know whether I would I mean, I mean I'm being extra cautious or cowardly I don't know whether I would you know do that or make references to crack yeah <laughs> or I mean, whatever I don't but, know if I would either but I mean it worked for him he was good he was he was really yeah good, so. I, I I, I thought it might be possibly a turning point in his career. Yeah, he was great. And, I, you know, I never... He talks about stuttering, but I don't see that on stage. Or maybe I'm not very observant. I don't think I've noticed that either. He's, he's a funny guy. Every, I think he every, talks about it as part of his act, but we're not, we're not revealing something shocking. Or, yeah. No, I think everybody uh, on the show really had a, had a good set, I thought. I mean, the crowd was really responsive and fun. They were a good time. Well, that's, a, again, I think that's an example of how perceptions vary. I, Jason maybe wasn't as, wasn't as um, high on the crowd, or, uh, but I thought it was a good crowd, particularly since uh, compared to the one that was there previous to uh, the previous month. Yeah. So you didn't talk about the crowd at Kazi's at all, which was kind of... So uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't much of a crowd. Yeah, that, that, well, that relates to what I was talking about earlier, which is that uh, the first time I did the open mic was the first of the month, and there was a lot of people there. It was like, I would say the room was two-thirds full. This time, I would say it was more like a third full. Yeah, and one guy brought 90% of the crowd. And uh, it's like, I don't know, it's like solar flares, <coughs> humidity, what other competing events there are? I mean, who you know? What's on television that night? Uh, you know, there are all sorts of variables that I think that enter into the turnout. So, yeah. you know. But anyway, but uh, but yeah, Wabi Sabi was a lot of fun. Um, what else? Oh, and uh, uh, Jeff Curran wasn't there because generously he wanted to. He, he felt like he was sort of monopolized. He'd been there been at everyone since the beginning so I think he wanted he wanted to write some stuff new stuff and I personally I, I don't know whether it's the same I don't think it's the same people there every time 
but he was it felt like he was kind of doing some of the same set so he wanted to write some new stuff but he also wanted to just kind of make room for some other yeah. comedians yeah he wasn't there I mean uh, any more thoughts about Wabi Sami? No, it's fun. I hope uh, hope Jason keeps doing it. I hope uh, have me back sometime. I, I had a blast. It was probably my most fun night, uh, you know, as far as with a crowd that I've had so far. So it was uh, it was great for me. And, uh, they were cool. He's yeah. talking about some other venue, but yeah, I don't you know that's not official, so I won't get into that. Uh, so Saturday, we you went to the writing session at the Funny Bone. I did. And you felt that was a really constructive. Uh, uh. Oh yeah, it was great. Uh, let's see, there was Jesse Thomas and Roy Rogers and David C. Wingfield and myself, and uh, we sat outside of the Funny Bone and on the in the patio patio, and we just kind of went around in a circle with um, taking you know one at a time, trying out either jokes that they've been do- you know we had all been doing and trying to work on or something an idea that is kind of you know in the process and just going through and bouncing ideas off and I think everybody I'd like to think everybody got something out of it uh, I know I definitely did um, they helped me as far as a couple of joke ideas and maybe shortening up some setups and those kind of things and helping uh, you know with like set with uh, drawing out a set like how to how to construct a set how you know some some tips for doing that so I, I really enjoyed it it was a lot of fun I got nothing but respect for all those guys and I think they're all hilarious so I, anything they tell me I'm I'm definitely you know right there uh, writing it all down so I can uh, learn as much as I can from things like that uh, but it's open to anybody any Richmond comics uh, are more than welcome to come to it just, just like this I guess I gather from Jesse that he wants to change the structure somewhat but again um you know that's TBA to be announced. Yeah. So um, yeah, he kind of organizes it. So I guess that's kind of his thing. That's his certainly that's his prerogative. Yeah. But I know I got a lot out of it. So you were, you were pleased with that? Yes. This is again, very, very maybe a characteristic of comedians is they're sort of hard on themselves, hard on the rooms, that they're, uh, which I is a good thing because it's creative dissatisfaction. Obviously, you're not going to improve if you're satisfied. Yeah. Uh, but maybe there was a disparity between you know his pr- his perspective and yours. Of course, he's the organizer and you're the participant. Well, I, I mean, I think the the format was a lot different than. I mean, he he was saying that it was one of the most uh, uh, productive ones that they've had in months or whatever. But it was a pretty small group, and uh, we were pretty focused. And I, I've my impression is that in the past, sometimes it tends to you know wander off into, you know, goofing around or, you know, whatever, you know, where they just don't feel like they get a lot done. Yeah. So um, I think we were pretty focused yesterday, and I think everybody kind of appreciated that. So. so that pretty much wraps up. Uh, oh, I guess, and then we went to we went to see uh, uh, the show that night. Yeah. Was uh, it called the late night show or the, yeah, the evening show? Yeah, the 10 or? o'clock show at uh, Funny Bone. We saw Ron Morey was the headliner. He was a... Uh, very funny, very high energy comic. Uh, Bill Blake was the feature, and and we I think we both really enjoyed him too. And uh, our own Jesse Thomas was uh, MC, and and that that was that was a fun show. I had, I had a blast. Yeah, my only regret is that I didn't get a, a picture of us with, uh, oh, with you know get somebody to take with, a picture with of us with Bill. those with those guys yeah. and with Edison. Yeah. Oh yeah. So. He said he's working on a DVD. I'd be interested to see that. Yeah, I don't I know like to... how how we rate being in the DVD, yeah, I know. but uh, we'll be in the credit reel. Well, yeah, so. we're we're you know we're like extras or whatever. Yeah, we'll be. We'll be but we're certainly not up there with Ron and Bill and Jesse. Yeah. Humble, humble, humble. Uh, Ninety minutes. Uh, I got I got plenty of whatever. We're kind of we're winding down here anyway. Yeah, I think so. We're going toward the, we're, we're getting toward the finish line. Uh, yeah, I, I think it was, it, it's it, it's it's interesting. It's like a it's like a fraternity, sorority, whatever you want to call it. And we're not the president of the chapter. We're, we're sort of like the pledges. 
Sure. But it's cool just to, to be at the, at the toga party. Yeah, it's cool. A little bit. Be, yeah. be invited and, and uh, get to find out what it's all about and, and learn from the guys who've been doing it for a long time. And just, you know, it's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, just, just the opportunity to go out and watch somebody do what you want to be doing and what you, you know, what uh, you're, you're trying, what you're just starting to try to do, you know, so just even, even if their style is totally different, you can just learn things about, I mean, I, I've been watching to see, like, how somebody pulls the mic off the stand, you know, because, like, or not, they or don't, not, they yeah. don't, they or don't, some people, uh, or some people don't, you know. That was one of the things that I ran into at uh, Wabi Sabi was <coughs> I was working off the mic and it kept, it would kind of slip or tilt. So I had to hold it to keep it from, you know, because there's a certain, obviously it's going to pick up, but the closer, the closer you are to the mic, so it's like, I couldn't be hands free because yeah. it would sort of gradually kind of, whatever, so I had to kind of hold it and to, to keep it on my mouth. I've never, I've never, in all the times of my short time doing comedy, I've, I've always picked a mic up and... I left it off the stand. It's just I went for a long period where I kept it on the stand and then I started taking it off. And Jesse worked worked off the mic stand and both yeah. Bill and Ron worked on the mic yeah. stand. And whatever I guess however you're comfortable. Yeah. The only consensus I guess would be that if you do take the mic out, be sure and move the mic stand out of the way. That's what way. they always say. But I saw somebody on Last Comic Standing who uh, um, did not, which supposedly that's a like a rank amateur. But again, people disagree. There are some people who think that if you're reading off a notebook, that's hacky. There are people who think if you read off a set list, that's hacky. Uh, there are some people that think if you take a drink onto the stage, that's hacky. I have no, you know, particular you know thoughts on that. If you think any of those things, you're probably thinking too hard. Well, I guess God is in the details for Richard Pryor or whatever. Uh, so that's that's uh, funny bone. Oh, uh, one other thing I wanted to say was these guys are craftsmen, artists, and. I differentiate them from what I would call stunt comics or novelty comics. People who like had a movie at one point, uh, were on a TV show, whatever, and they're just kind of trading off of uh, you know, their fame. And they may, may not necessarily be like comic comics or comedians comics yeah. or whatever. Uh, so. Uh, these guys are just like, you know, just get out there and, and They're pros make and people laugh for 40 minutes or 50 minutes or Yeah, yeah you can definitely whatever. tell they, they take it, they take being funny very seriously. Yeah, and they got, you know, they got, and it's interesting to me, I mean, it's like after 10 years or whatever, they're still like passionate about, they're still like, when they start talking about different aspects of how you do this or how you do that, they're, they're still very into uh, the biz. For the industry. So, oh, incidentally, the, uh, this is a callback. Uh, I didn't see Last Comic Standing. I got busy, so I, I didn't see the latest episode. I, I like I like to watch it. If there are people that are that are uh, down on it, but I like I, I'll be thankful for any scraps from the table I can pick up. And uh, my objections are. are Positive statements have already been registered in previous podcasts, so I ain't going to talk about it some more. Can you think of anything else you want to talk about? Um, did you want to talk about oh, um, conventions? And oh, yeah, 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 okay, well. Um, or do you want to save that for another What do you think? Oh, let's talk about it. This, this, okay. this, I, I believe, firmly believe in, like, eating the last bit of gristle off the chicken. Let's do it. This is, an, this is like a marathon. This is like an endurance thing. Yeah. Okay. So. 15. This is the 15th round right now. Yeah, we're now at the one hour and 38 minute mark. 
Curmudgeons of Comedy uh, is a is a is a comedy collective group consortium, whatever you want to talk about. <coughs> you, me, Roy Rogers, Jesse Jarvis, Jeff Curran, Jason Klingman. I asked Corey Marshall. I never heard back from him. I don't know whether that's his polite way of saying no. DMG, he's he's in it. Right? DMG, OMG, OG. <laughs> He's in it, and uh, our official videographer is Silver Persinger, and uh, did I leave anybody? See, that's a, that's a, I always hate that. It's like I'll, I'll get like eight out of nine or nine out of ten, and then there'll be one person, and then they'll be pissed off because I forgot them. It's like, hey, I have Alzheimer's. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> did we left anybody off? I think that's everybody. Okay. Um, and, and we'll get some more... Uh, um, there's some people that like are really busy or maybe um, you know want to get paid um, so I haven't asked them you know it's not not being uh, offensive or whatever uh, and and you are the first person to submit your biography which I will read here and do Polly started be uh, began performing stand-up comedy in the summer of 2010 in Richmond Virginia he has appeared at the Richmond Funny Bones Crash of the Comics, the Red Stag Buck and Comedy Throwdown, 955 Club, Wabi Sabi in Petersburg, Virginia, and Richmond's Cafe Diem, among other venues. The young comic style has been described as profoundly absurd or absurdly profound. That's just me. Combining a deadpan delivery with wordplay and surreal humor. His comedic influences include George Carlin, Steve Martin, Bill Hicks, Stephen Wright, Mitch Hedberg, Emo Phillips, Jimmy Carr, the Marx Brothers, and Mel Brooks. When not on stage, Andrew spends time reading, writing jokes, and mini bios. What are mini bios? What are you reading right now? Oh. What are you reading right now? That was a joke in itself. And attending comedy related events in the Richmond area. He graduated from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia with a BS degree. Any type of major? It was pretty much BS. No, but I mean, like, what did you do? I was a communications major. Okay. Mass comm? Mass comm. So, what were. We have a website. Uh, we have one biography. And I just used I just used a photograph from Aztec Grill, Refried Comedy. And if you look, got another picture of maybe that Adam took or somebody that you want to use, I have no. I just stuck that up there because I had access to it. Uh, so, but do we want to maybe? Um, I guess the idea for the it's kind of like a, a comedy collective, like a comedy troupe, and the idea being that we can kind of kind of have a show in a box that we can just kind of instead of I guess somebody trying to worry about you know getting all different kinds of acts, you know, you can say that for you, you can say hey, you just you just uh, you just book the Promotions of comedy, and you know, we, all you have to do is book us, and, and we we provide all the entertainment, and uh, we can kind of be be a collective. And I guess there's a lot of you know opportunities to do some fun things with it, and you know, it probably wouldn't even have to be the thing. We probably got enough people that if not everybody could come to the show, we could still. That do that show. was my idea. Was yeah. that you, you know, there's always going to be somebody that's going to be working at the Funny Bone. Either here in Virginia Beach or Somewhere whatever, yeah. you know, they'll be booked doing something else, or they'll have some kind of family emergency or commitments or whatever. So the idea was to get enough people so that we could do, and and, and we've discussed this before, but for the podcast, <laughs> what do you think is the optimal length for a show? What about an hour and a half, maybe two hours, okay. something like that. Mm-hmm. I would think. I mean, I think with something like this, it, you know, you probably, it would probably be good, especially early on, to do, like, uh, firecrackers. As uh, there's a song by X called Hey Baby, It's the Fourth of July. Yeah. It is the Fourth of July. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. The, the interruption was definitely not you. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I would I would say probably, you know, we could do a lot of things with, like, you know, like a bunch of 10-minute spots or whatever, you know, as opposed to maybe, like, like the show we saw last night was, like, a 10-minute opener and then a 20-minute feature and then an hour-long uh, headliner. You know, 
probably not set it up like that. I think I'm Travis kidding. really, Travis Charles really enjoyed Wabi Sabi. He yeah. I think he was really into it. Yeah. So. Which is understandable because the crowd liked him. Yeah. But I think, I mean, the format of Wabi Sabi was kind of, I think, maybe more like what we're talking about. You know, Travis did more time than everybody else because yeah. he was kind of like the headliner. But And I could see, like, where we, maybe we might want to rotate. Yeah, yeah. Somebody would be the, the, the uh, headliner, yeah. for lack of a better word, and sort of, you know, whoever's got the, the most time, uh, you know. Or yeah. whoever feels up to it, or whoever take take turns whatever. being the MC, you know, and those kind of things. I think would be it'd be a good practice, you know, good learning. I think for everybody, and expose them to different uh, aspects of you know being in the different parts of the show and stuff like that. I think it's a cool. Uh, I think it's a cool concept. I hope I hope it uh, takes off. And one of the things I want to do is get a to do list and just write down different things. To do um, and also I've started sort of like a, a goal list of uh, what people want to accomplish with the uh, with the group. For example, Jeff Curran would like to have a comedy a uh, comedians oops comedians of comedy special on Comedy Central. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to see us do a show in Richmond. Sure. Uh, and Jason just wants to make a living from doing stand-up, which may or may not relate to the curmudgeons. And do you have a particular goal that you'd like to see us accomplish? Or? For the curmudgeons, I guess, I guess to get booked and, and just be out there a lot. Um, I mean, like my, my personal goal is to eventually be, you know, a self-supporting um, comic. You know, that, that'd be my only source of income and be... Constantly. That's 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 Jason Klingman's goal. Too. Yeah, um, but I think you know for the for the group itself, I get you know just to get out there and um, to to travel a little bit with it. I think would be a, a realistic goal, you know, to try to try to hit maybe some spots in the Virginia, you know, Mid Atlantic area and um, try to take it, expose this group of comics to you know different different areas in this region, and then um, also expose the comics to different you know. Areas too. So. Well, in a, in a way, I don't believe in realistic goals because Robert Fritz has a, makes a point that you really don't know what you can accomplish until you set out to do it. Mm -hmm. It's like, I think I can cross the street, but I might get hit by a car. Right. I might be wrong. I really won't know whether I can cross the street until I actually accomplish it. So I don't have a problem with, uh, I'm sure there's some people that would say, well, Jeff Kern's goal is unrealistic. But I think the point that Fritz makes Maybe is... Maybe it has a low probability, but it's not unrealistic. Yeah. It's a big difference, yeah. Well, but Robert Fritz makes the point is people won't invest in... It's like, if you're... Like, the example I use is uh, Malcolm X. Uh, his guidance counselor told him... Like a carpenter or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember. Yeah. Did you read the autobiography? No, I just read about it. Oh, I say that's one of my. That's like that's an amazing. Oh, so, shameless plug for the autobiography of Malcolm. He Mouse. wanted to become a lawyer. Yeah. And his guidance counselor said, you know, that's not realistic. Be a, a laborer or some kind. That's yeah. that's kind of what you're limited to. And instead, he became a pimp. Pimp and drug dealer. Which some people would say that's actually better than becoming a lawyer. Probably more honorable. There you go. At least you're giving value for for money. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I guess it all depends on what you want. I mean, At least either your rates either are reasonable. either way, you know, you're getting fucked. But, but <laughs> lawyers is probably less satisfying to get fucked by a lawyer. Um, your pimp can help you get off. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I I understand where you're coming from. I think that it's a good idea to set like intermediate goals, immediate goals, intermediate goals, and then, then long-term the goals. goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And realistically speaking, we ain't going to get no uh, on Comedy Central in, in two months. So. Yeah, yeah. so then what would be an intermediate goal then? I think the first, the first goal I think would probably be to get, get this, this group booked somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then from there maybe it's like, you know, get booked to a different club and then maybe, you know, it's like get booked X amount of times in a month, you know, mm -hmm. those, those kind of things, like, you know, incremental, yeah, and then, and then, you know, I mean, it, it may get to the point where 
you know, kind of have it together for a year and it doesn't seem like it's going anywhere, so you give up. Or maybe going for a year and it's like, wow, we've already gone in a year way past where we thought we would with this thing, so maybe we're going to have to adjust our timeline or, or move some of these goals up because we're moving faster than we thought we would. You know? So I, I think it gets hard to, yeah, it's just hard to know, but uh, I'm excited about it. I'm excited about all the comics that are involved. Yeah, I, I know there are people that, that are jaded about touring, but I, the limited amount I've done, which is just trips to Newport News and, uh, and Petersburg, I enjoy getting out, meeting different people, getting to different places. I mean, I like Richmond, but I, I also like going to different places and uh, meeting new people, seeing new sites. Yeah. Well, you want to get in front of different people and be in different rooms. That's and, a, you know, those that's a cliche. Is try and perform in, in as many different environments yeah. as, as possible. So I would, I would like, to, I, would, I have no objection to touring at all. Yeah. Um, before, uh, before we forget, do you want to plug the RVA stand up? Yeah, that's on my list. Okay. I I started RVA stand up back in May of this year. And it had been something I'd been sort of thinking about for a while. And my initial idea was, well, I'll just put it up and kind of futz around and learn about graphic design and get better at it. <coughs> and I bought a sort of a poor man's dream weaver. And none of their templates particularly fit. And I figured by the time I got through customizing them, it would be almost like building a new website from scratch, which I really wasn't too enthused about. Because like my my more emphasis is like getting it out there rather than sort of doing something fresh and original. So I basically wound up with Tumblr. So I'm working with templates, and so basically all I'm doing is like sticking the content into these templates, which I'm not particularly. We started out we had a template based on uh, a legendary graphic designer named Saul Bass who did a movie poster called The Man with a Golden Arm. And there was a template based on that, but as uh, Silver pointed out, it's like, what's a hypodermic needle doing in this? <clears throat> Didn't make any particular sense. So I switched to another template, which is based on Esquire magazine, and it, I don't think it's particularly evocative of <coughs> stand-up, but it was the best I could find. But the great advantage of Tumblr is if I find a better one, all it takes is a couple of clicks, and it changes. I don't have to go back and change things page by page by page. And so, you know, my goal, I would like, I would not, I don't want to be like the only one that does this. I'd like to have other people contribute to it. Because, uh, like, that's one thing I got to balance is, like, doing this kind of stuff versus, like, writing and uh, performing. So it's like I'm not, uh, don't want it to consume too much. So I'm hoping that other people will kind of shine in and, and submit stuff as Silver has done. Um, so and and hopefully be a good resource for area, you know, comedians and try to put up a schedule as Silver suggested. Uh, but there's only so much time that I'm, I'm willing to devote to it. Uh, so I'll do as much as I can. And if anybody complains, they say, "Hey, you get what you pay for." <laughs> so, do you have any thoughts? Or? I haven't checked it out yet. I'll be honest with you. I haven't checked it out yet. Um, uh, you know, they, see, that's the problem I've run into, and uh, and and you're talking about this too. Is like all these people are doing all these different things, and if I spent all my time, or you spent all your time checking out everybody's various projects. You wouldn't get anything done. Yeah. You wouldn't do any writing. You wouldn't do any performing. Yeah. So, like, while, um, you know, I'm not going to single anybody out, but there's a lot of sort of side stuff going on, and uh, and I don't want to, you know, offend anybody, whatever, but I sort of, like, I'll share it on Facebook, whatever, but I'm not visiting it every day. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it'll maybe it'll turn out to be a good resource, you know, for Richmond for comedy. Or so, not? Yeah, well, I, mean, I guess uh, kind of part. You know, maybe I should, but I I um, 
I haven't, I haven't set any concrete goals for it. I don't do it. Uh, uh, it's, it, it's, it's kind of an afterthought. It's like if I'm at an event, I, I'd spend a, f a few minutes taking some pictures. I'll put them up. It's not a, not a heavy-duty investment yeah. uh, in terms of time. Uh, so, you got any thoughts, Silver? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are you doing? I take a picture of us. Oh, okay. <laughs> Knock yourself out. Let me put my hat on first. <laughs> Turn up my volume so I can hear the, the click. Yeah, that's, I, I forgot to do that. I need to. I need to get some pictures of uh, for official podcast pictures, but uh, we don't need to be running the. the uh, a little sideways, but uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so we don't need. To, we don't need to run the tape while we're doing that. So this has been the Krakajokia, Krakajoko. East of Java podcast for July the 4th, 2010, taped at the Lamplighter Cafe and Roasting Company in Richmond, Virginia. Not safe for work, you already knew that. Available under Creative Commons license for attribution. Your host was Chris Martin. Your co-moderator was Andrew Pauley. Yes. Our official videographer was Silver Persinger. Good night, America, and all the ships at sea. Uh, this is the 4th of July, so like public service announcement, don't blow your arm off tonight. Unless you're really dumb and have it coming to you, in that case, it was probably fate. Case, you need to get out of the gene pool. Yeah, it was probably anyway. fate. Blow your reproductive organs off so you don't reproduce. Fireworks are illegal in, in Richmond, Virginia, just about everything. I think even sparklers are illegal in Richmond, Virginia, which is sort of weird because it's like you can go into a bar carrying a gun or a restaurant. They don't. Come in. We're not allowed to have bars in Richmond, Virginia, but you can't you can't set off fire uh, sparklers. So it's like I think that's a little weird. Bottle rockets are illegal. Whistlers, M80s, whatever. But you can go. Government, please protect us from ourselves. Feel feel free to walk into a, a restaurant with a with a piece strapped on you. And so, and there are parts of Richmond where they do fire off. It's sort of like Devil's Night in uh, Detroit. There's this, there's is Oregon Hill one of those places uh, like where Churchill. they fire off guns into the air. Churchill. Oh, Churchill is that the tradition there? So stay out of Church Hill because you might you might have a bullet um, land on your head, and it hurts, or so I've been told. So that's it. Thank you.